Ever since our childhood, we have been introduced to the concept of the caveman. Our imaginations were swept away by cartoons like the Flintstones that romanticized what life might have been like back in the days of the Stone Age. Even recent advertisements for Geico Insurance have jokingly brought the caveman into the 21st century. When we hear the word Neanderthal, common images that spring to mind are that of a brutish figure dragging the woman of his fancy off to a cave, or a man dressed in a loincloth chiseling away at the first wheel. Although the caveman has been immortalized in popular culture, a majority of us understand that at one time humans did indeed live in caves, dressed in animal skins, and hunted woolly mammoths during the last great ice age. Their endeavors have been well documented on the walls of their former homes, as can be seen in this vivid depiction of the hunt that has been preserved for millennia. In fact, anthropologists have learned much about the Neanderthals by studying their remains, and it is well understood that early humans began as hunter-gatherers, then with more experience and the slow accumulation of knowledge, they learned to tame the land, develop agriculture, and eventually how to harness the materials found in the earth to usher in the Bronze Age, then the Iron Age, leaving the Stone Age behind. However, all that we currently understand about the life of early man, and every shred of evidence discovered by countless anthropologists, biologists, and archaeologists is dismissed by the Bible's account of the first human beings. In Genesis chapter 4 we are introduced to Cain and Abel, whom the Bible portrays as the first naturally born humans on planet Earth, the children of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 3 we learn, Now Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. The first murder was committed by Cain as the result of his jealousy toward God's preference of Abel's sacrifice of a lamb over his vegetable offerings. The Bible makes a clear declaration, at the beginning of human history, mankind had a solid understanding of the principles of agriculture and the domestication of animals. The Bible appears to put forth the claim that God somehow inspired the almost instantaneous development of such concepts as crop rotation, irrigation, the design of tools for plowing and harvesting, how to breed and domesticate livestock, and so on. With the rapid accumulation of knowledge in producing and preserving food, Humans of the biblical history were not bound to the daily struggle of hunting or gathering for their sustenance, and instead were free to devote their time and resources toward other pursuits. In fact, this is exactly what the Bible describes. We saw in part 2 of this series that there was 1,556 years from the appearance of Adam to the flood of Noah. Civilization during this period of time had grown so fast and become so corrupt, it was necessary for God to cleanse the earth and start anew. However, the technology of agriculture and animal domestication was not lost in the flood for Noah passed on this information to the following generations, as is evidenced by the numerous cultures known to exist before and after the time of the Flood. However, if we are to accept the Bible's version of human history, what does this say about the anthropological evidence of early humans that has been collected from across the globe? The Bible claims the very first humans had such advanced techniques in the acquisition of food, they were able to immediately organize themselves into great societies, consisting first of villages, then cities, and eventually empires. So exactly when did the cavemen exist? Who were the Neanderthals and where did they come from? Five hundred thousand years ago, Europe was a cold and unforgiving place to live. To the north, there was a great ice sheet that brought polar conditions to much of the continent. Herds of woolly mammoth roamed the grassland, and limestone caves provided shelter for the people of this region. These were the Neanderthal, and they were the first humans to adapt to these harsh conditions. The Neanderthal's world was much smaller than the one we know today. Arctic tundra to the north, and vast stretches of sea and then desert to the south restricted their territory to Europe and Western Asia. Even at their peak, it is estimated as few as 100,000 Neanderthals lived within this border. Bones and artifacts have been found as far south as Israel, to Uzbekistan and the Ukraine to the east, Poland, Germany, and even Wales to the north, and to Portugal in the far west. But southwest France was one of the most densely populated regions, home to as many as 3,000 Neanderthals. 
The size of their caves and the debris left within them suggest Neanderthals lived in very small groups, perhaps no more than 25 members and sometimes as small as 8. The cave was the center of their world. Within its walls they slept, ate, butchered meat, and even defecated. The discarded waste that littered the floor of the Neanderthal caves became buried and then over time fossilized. Far from the ape-like and brutish characters of popular myth, we now know that they were a strong, intelligent, and highly adapted species. The glaciers not only changed the landscape, but also the features of the Neanderthal that lived there. The Neanderthal bones were strong, a direct result of the stresses that they were subjected to. The walls of the Neanderthal leg bones were particularly thick. Joints of the elbow, hip, and knee were also enlarged, shaped by the continual pressure and stress of their lives. Seen in contrast to the modern leg beside it, Neanderthal legs were not only thick and bowed, they were also much shorter than our own. Short, heavy bodies reduced the skin's surface area, helping to maintain their body temperature. Even their noses evolved to cope with the extremely cold weather. Their nasal cavities were much larger than ours and contained extra capillaries and mucus to warm and moisturize the air. This combination of features makes Neanderthal the first human species specifically adapted to a cold climate. Meat makes up 12% of our diet, but the Neanderthal's diet was very different. By analyzing the samples of Neanderthal bone, we can tell a lot about what they ate. Extremely high levels of carbon and nitrogen confirm meat made up a bulk of their diet. Fossilized feces known as coprolites have also been analyzed and are shown to consist almost entirely of protein. It is also evident from the feces their food was well digested, suggesting Neanderthals evolved to specifically cope with a diet consisting of up to 85% meat, on par with carnivores. The Neanderthals also had a variety of tools, used to do anything from chopping wood to scraping hides. They even fashioned knives and spears. The life of Neanderthal was extremely difficult. Nearly half of all Neanderthal children died before adolescence. Skulls that do not have all of their adult teeth descended from the gums make up much of the fossil record. Defects in their dental enamel suggest starvation was one of the major killers. But it is the many skeletal remains of babies that provides the most poignant evidence of how harsh life really was. Despite everything we know about Neanderthal, scientists wanted to examine their DNA to see once and for all how similar or dissimilar Neanderthals were to modern day humans. Throughout the 1990s, there were several trials in the amplification of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA by use of PCR, or a polymerase chain reaction, a technique which can be used to create many copies of an initially small number of molecules. The results were conclusive. The Neanderthal genome was well outside the limits of modern day humans. However, in 2008, Svant Pabo of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, in addition to a number of other scientists, successfully sequenced the first complete Neanderthal genome, extracted from a 38,000-year-old fossil from Croatia. The scientists created a graph showing the numbers of base pair differences between humans, Neanderthals, and chimpanzees. Because they were able to compare across the entire genome rather than only a small portion of it, the differences between human and Neanderthal was far more striking. The conclusion of the study was this. Analysis of the assembled sequence unequivocally establishes that the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA falls outside the variation of exant human mitochondrial DNAs and allows an estimate of the divergence state between the two mitochondrial DNA lineages of 660,000 years, plus or minus 140,000 years. Thus, we are provided with unwavering evidence. Neanderthals are a different species of hominid from that of modern day humans. However, this begs the question of what happened to Neanderthal, and if Neanderthal was just our cousin, where did we come from? <laughs>